chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And we're certainly excited about this opportunity. Our purpose is to encourage and to wreck your hearts to do uh, hard to God with commitment to serve and to live the life of Christ. Each year, the Boulevard men uh, have a men's annual men's retreat. Uh, and this year it was December the 29th and the 30th at the Carter Retreat in Thyatira, Mississippi. At that retreat, uh, this is in the past years, we have we uh, were directed to reflect on the work from the previous year uh, and take it very personal about what we were able to do and what we were able to, what we came short on, so that in 2024, we have a charge about uh, doing the work that we need to do according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we all as men uh, uh, reflected personally, and we left that with a charge that we need committed men to do the Lord's work. I'm certain, I'm very certain that the intention and wisdom of our spiritual leader, Brother William Michael Jackson, led him to give more on what commitment looks like with, uh, with us today by the theme. Our purpose that every man here would leave with a made up man to do the master's work. The speakers will encourage us from the scriptures of Romans chapter 12, verses one to three, and brothers, we are encouraging you to listen, to learn, reflect, and take copious notes. One of my uh, late brother, Brother Ollie Smith, that was one of his favorite things to say, is to take copious notes. Uh, the scriptures that, were, that uh, they will be dealing with today are full, are full of action for us to think through and to leave here with a made up mind. Brothers, we are so thankful to have you in our presence today, and we hope that you leave here today with a made up mind to do the master's work uh, and be intro reflective about what each one of us can do individually to uh, help change this world. Thank you so much. Good morning, brothers. <clears throat> Would you go with me in prayer? Dear gracious, <clears throat> excuse me, dear gracious Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. We thank you for allowing us to assemble this morning for the purpose intended, and it is for the Boulevard Annual Men's Day. We thank you, Father, for allowing these brothers to attend, to make the time in their schedules to be available for learning more about your word, your will, and your way. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who, who, who've come. We pray that you would give them the opportunity to, to gain more knowledge and also to give them the courage necessary to take that knowledge and apply it wherever they may be serving. We pray, Father, that you would also be with us as we go forward and help us to to understand what our role is in the church, in the home, as well as wherever we may be. Father, our theme is a made up mind to be men for the master. And we pray, Father, that those who come behind me will be able to remember the information that they've studied as they present their topics, and also that they would do it with conviction and also in a way that can be easily understood. We just pray, Father, that for all the things that you do, we want to give you thanks. And we thank you most of all for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins so that we may have a right to the tree of life. We pray, Father, that as we go forward, you would forgive us of our sins as we honestly turn from them. And in your daughter's son, Jesus' name, we pray and ask it all. Amen.
morning. As we get started on this morning by way of songs, Mansion, Robe, and Crown. I know this is one of the ones that we all know, Mansion, Robe, and Crown. And I like to make sure that I don't miss my verses up, so sometimes I have to refer back to, to the words, so. I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears no sorrow can be found. When I receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. There's always a bound. Just let me on your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion. Robe and crown. The weather there is always fair. There's sunshine day and night. No cold nor rain will fall there. For the sun shines ever bright. And I'll need no heavy garments. I'll just wrap my robe around. When I receive a mansion. Robe and crown. My man. Robe and a crown. There, love always abound. Just let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion. Robe and crown, my head is bowed and bloody now from the work that I tried to do. But one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear a smile so bright for there'll be no cause for a frown when I receive my mansion. Robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. There love will always abound. Just let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion. Robe and crown. It's the first time leading that with our brothers. It sounds, sounds strange having just the bass part come in. Here, so. <laughs> amen. Somebody will say amen in here this morning. Amen. amen. What a mighty God we serve because he's good not just some of the time, but he's showing up good all the time. All the time, God is good. Amen, somebody. We are so thankful to the God of heaven for blessing us, first of all, to experience life uh, on this time side yet again. And then to find out we're here uh, this morning to be a part of this annual men's day here uh, on the boulevard. Uh, I can't think of any better place to be on a Saturday morning. Amen, somebody. Then in the house of God, uh, with those fellow laborers in Christ, uh, as we seek to try to learn better how to do uh, God's will. We have a good time in store uh, for you on this morning, and we are uh, thankful again to your presence. Uh, toward the end of our program, we'll recognize uh, all of our visitors, and we see a number of our brothers from uh, across the city, many from other areas, from East Jackson, uh, some brothers from down to Ruville, uh, from down to uh, uh, Brother Billy Moore's place, and just glad to have you. Yeah. Amen. Then, of course, always uh, glad to uh, look up and see uh, our dear friend who is back home, uh, William Jones. Yeah. Amen. And uh, he's in town, he and his family, uh, Christian is playing his last game, I believe, at um, um, Christian Brothers uh, on today. And the family's here 
uh, for that and, and always glad to have him uh, with us whenever he's in town. We are laboring from uh, this year's theme, a made-up mind to be men for the master. And brothers, I, I don't have to tell you, uh, we're, we're dealing and living in some difficult days, not just in our society, but we are facing much in the Lord's church. Amen, somebody. And, and if the Lord's church now, regardless of what we do, the church going to stand. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, the church going to stand. But I think it, it should behoove us that if we're going to help the church be what God wants it to be, we're going to have to be men. We're going to have to be real men. We're going to have to be men to have a made-up mind to serve the master. And, and, and our prayer is, is that uh, what you will uh, gain from your uh, gathering and your time, our time here together today, is that when we leave here, we'll leave here uh, being better men, being men with made-up minds to be all that we can be for Christ. Our opening speaker this morning is no stranger, uh, particularly to this church, a longtime friend of the Boulevard. In fact, uh, formerly the assistant minister for, I believe, about four years, uh, labored uh, along with uh, O.J. Shabazz, ultimately went to Klondike and now serves the southeast side and Norris Road. Uh, Churches of Christ. Uh, Don Burnell Holly is a good guy. He's a he's a great preacher, uh, used all across this brotherhood, lectureships, uh, gospel meetings. Uh, he has been with us on a number of occasions here uh, on the boulevard. Uh, not only is he a good preacher, is he a good man, but he's he's a personal friend. Uh, of mine. Uh, our relationship probably spans better than 50 years. Uh, amen. We used to travel the highways and byways together uh, when when we were coding and single. Yeah. And I'm going to leave that right there. <laughs> yeah. And God blessed all of us with good wives. Amen, somebody. He and I and Brother Mike Cathy and Brother Duran Cathy, and we just used to have a good time uh, in the Lord. And uh, we, we're just thankful that, that uh, our relationship has, uh, has remained constant uh, all these years. In fact, we, uh, my wife and I are godparents to his youngest son. Uh, amen. So we just enjoyed uh, a wonderful relationship over the years. And uh, we just thank God for, for uh, Burn and Pat and for the work that he's doing in the kingdom, uh, not just in this city, but in the kingdom. We're going to get out of his way. Uh, he is laboring uh, from Romans chapter 12, verse 1 uh, on this morning. He's going to be laboring under the subject, giving our all to God. Uh, he's going to bless us, I believe, this morning. We're going to get out of his way and let him have his way. After another selection of song, the next voice you will hear will be that of our dear friend and brother uh, from the southeast side and Norris Road uh, congregation, Brother Don Bernal Holly. Come on. Salvation has been brought down. Another one which is going to be odd hearing our brothers sing it. 
Jesus gave his life for ransom, you know, on Calvary, on Mount Calvary, a cruel Calvary, paved the way by blood that we might win a bright shining crown, praise his holy name, salvation has been brought down, oh glory, praise the Lord. Salvation has been brought down. Just go and shout and tell the world around. Tell it today. Tell it today. Just preach the word of God that we might win around. Just tell the law. Salvation is full and free. Just spread the new all over the land and sea. Tell it all far. Just tell it all far. Praise the Lord. Salvation has been brought down. All alone without a friend. He suffered to pay it all. Oh, yes, he paid it all. Jesus paid it all, and in his blessed promises, sweet victory can be found. Just praise his holy name, salvation has been brought down, O oh, glory. Just praise the Lord, salvation has been brought down. Just go and shout and tell the world around. Tell it today, just tell it today, preach the word of God that we might win a crown, tell the law, salvation is full and free, just spread the news all over the land and sea, tell it afar. Just tell it off all. Praise the Lord. Salvation has been brought down. Let this assembly say amen. amen. If you believe that salvation has been brought down, would you smile and say amen again? Amen. We want to first of all acknowledge the almighty God as we continue to give thanks for the great and the preeminent head of the church, Jesus Christ, his beloved son. He has been called the Rose of Sharon. He has been called the wheel in the middle of Ezekiel's wheel. Biblical scholars are somewhere debating about the relevancy and the interpretive nature of that, but this morning we do believe, and we're absolutely sure that he is the root and the offspring of David. He's the bright in the morning star. Max Matthew, the tax collecting Jew, says his name is called Jesus purpose clause because he saves his people from their sin. It's a good time to be alive. It's a good time to be standing on top Saul rather than top Saul standing on us. Talking with Brother Bacchus a few moments ago, it was a few months ago when I lost 57 pounds, was headed to that long home in the grave. And I'm telling you, brethren, when you have a near-death experience, it gives you a new perspective on life. Amen. All of us have got to get to the point in life where we've got to make up our minds we're not going to allow anybody or anything to worry us. What a mighty God we serve. Brother Jackson, thank you for the invitation to come uh, to play a small part in this great series of Men's Day lectures. Amen. To the bishops, the deacons, and the power that sits in the pews at this church, thank you for allowing a balding slew-footed, bull-legged preachers to come back to the boulevard where nothing is too hard for God. Yes. Brother Jones, it's good to see you, man. Yes. Amen. It's kind of intimidating to be in here with these great gospel preachers and a couple of these guys got PhDs. It's kind of intimidating. Amen. But I'm from to the point in life now where it just don't matter much at all. I miss, yeah, let me break some verbs. I'm just going to do the little I can do and get out of the way and let these guys handle it. Is it all right to read the Bible in this church? Amen, I'm looking for my lesson to be on the screen. 
Hey, that, that, my granddaddy said, hey, he is. All right, Romans chapter 12 and verse number one. Romans chapter 12 and verse number one. I'd like to like to get back there to fix the screen back up because I messed it up. All right. Are y'all all right in here? Y'all need to help me. Let me apologize to you. My good brother in our congregation at Norris, Brother Stanley Gordon, lost his mother. So I'm going to leave here running this morning because the funeral starts at 10. Please, in your private prayers, pray for the Gordon family because you know it's a tremendous loss when anybody loses their mother. Y'all are going to help me here. To the brethren who have come from Emerald City and from the Mecca this morning, it's good to see y'all. I see y'all, brethren. I got my glasses on. I see you. Appreciate y'all coming to support your preacher this morning. Now, the rest of y'all, y'all just strange. Brethren, don't get up and come to church on no Saturday morning. Y'all some good brethren. I said, amen. I believe y'all got a chance to go to heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is it all right to read the Bible on the Sabbath? Yeah, all right. Romans 12 and verse number 1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Under the majestic theme of made-up man to be men for the master. I won't talk for a little while. Let's preach and speak till I get through from the subject this morning, giving our all to God. Giving our all to God. Three homiletic hinges upon which this lesson will swing. Number one, divinity made up his mind to be the master for humanity. Point number two, mankind can make up his mind to be a man for the master. Then as we prepare to close, men can put their all in all into it. Y'all got time for this? Uh, a made-up mind to be men for the master. The assigned subject, giving our all in all to God. We want to say, first of all, that the contextual setting and situation of our text under consider consideration this morning. As we look at the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, in verse 1, we see a conjunctive word. A word, therefore, that means that whatever Paul is teaching in the beginning of this chapter is connected to what he just said in the previous chapter. So conjunctively, we've got to address the context. Uh, Dr. Jones and uh, Dr. Billy Carl Moore will tell you that uh, anytime you teach the word of God, if you take it out of context, you got a pitiful false pretext. And so who is this now? This is the pristine Apostle Paul. I, I uh, say this all the time and folk think I made it up, but I got it from William Jones. This is Paul. Uh, amen, y'all. Y'all know Paul? He says he's the wandering itinerant tent maker from Tarsus. Don't that sound good? <laughs> sound like I made it up, but I stole it. I said, amen, praise the Lord. This, this text finds Paul. Uh, that uh, globe-trotting apostle through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing to the church at Rome. He was ready to preach the gospel to those who were at Rome also. If you're going to make up your mind to be a man for the master, we've got to learn to subjugate our will to the will of God. Paul was one of those guys who wanted to do one thing but decided to do another thing. Because his thing was not the Lord's thing. Paul wanted to preach to his kinsmen in the flesh. Because he wanted to fix up what he had messed up. You see, before he was converted, he was the number one enemy of the law. He was the number one enemy of the church. And he was on his way to Damascus. To bind men and women uh, who were following uh, what he called a blasphemous Hebrew named Jesus. But the Lord knocked him down, amen, blinded him by the light. And from that point forward, Paul wanted to fix up what he had messed up. Y'all come on, help me here. I, I'm, I'm trying to get my bearings here. You see, conjunctively, 
Uh, don't that sound good? Uh, conjunctively. Uh, therefore, you see, something had happened in chapter 11 that's being hooked to chapter 12. Paul said, I beg you, brethren, I'm beseeching you by the message of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So you see, when he talks about giving your body as a living or a spiritual sacrifice, that's, that's called putting your all in all into it. I leave something everywhere I go. You know what that means? I got to be real careful where I go. Gotta catch up with some of y'all before you get to your car. Mike told y'all 50, well, let's long. What happened 50 years ago? Let that long. I said, amen, praise the Lord. You see, therefore, conjunctively, Paul taught a whole lot of things in Romans chapter 11 that we don't have time uh, to deal with this morning. So let me just give you an overview. Romans 11, 33 and 34, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Y'all know about God, don't you? How deep is God? How unsearchable are his judgments? And his ways past finding out. Here comes the interrogative statement, Dr. Moore. Here comes the question. Who has known the mind of God? And who has been God's counselor? Uh, I ain't forgotten where we are now. Divinity did everything that he could. Because before God made the world, he made up his own mind to be uh, the master divinity made up his mind to be the master for a humanity. We don't have time to deal, dig into that now because divinity is not who we know as God, God the Father only. This is Elohim. This is a plurality of personalities. This is God. This is God the Word and God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead made up his mind. I know these three, you know, there's three personalities, but three, these three are one. And these three agree in one. I said divinity before there was ever hum humanity. Divinity made up his mind to be a master for humanity. That means that the Godhead made up his mind to be a master for human humanity. Because you know it's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. The steps of a good man are always going to be ordered in the Lord. Y'all I got to get down from here. Amen. I see they got a clock back there, and that's kind of intimidating, too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, let me just say this before I close. Don't y'all go nowhere telling somebody, bro, Holly didn't have no lesson. That's a lie, bro. Holly ain't got no time. So if you're going to tell it, tell it right. I I'm just apologizing to you. I can't finish. I'm going to have to chop this up. Amen. But, well, let me see here. In Romans chapter 11. Let me give you an overview of what Paul is really saying. Because you see, conjunctively, when he gets to therefore, and says we need to put our all and all into it. Therefore, we need to uh, present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. You see, Paul gives us an overview of how God made up his mind uh, as divinity to be a master for humanity. You do know Psalms 90 uh, that from everlasting to everlasting he is God. Before the mountains ever came forward and before the world was ever created or formed, God, could, God already was. Amen. You see when, when Moses writes in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that's not the beginning of God. That's the beginning of the creation of God. And so God takes humanity and human time and it sucks it into uh, an eternity where he already existed. Would I warn your faith? If I talk to you about the determinate counsel and the full knowledge of God, would I wound your faith if I talk to you about foreordination and predestination, not of individuals, but of the plan of salvation? Would I, would I tell you that God gave man everything? Because he made up his mind. He made up his mind. Divinity made up his mind to be the master for humanity. But you know us, don't you? We'll mess up free lunch. Mankind lost the eternal life that God gave him. But look, ain't on, you don't have to panic. 
I said he made, I don't want to wound nobody's faith here, but he made the plan before he made the man. Amen. You see, if you think that the gospel shows up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's way too late. The gospel was in the mind of God before he framed the word. He said in the Garden of Eden that the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent. Serpent was going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. That was in God's mind before he framed the word. Then he expanded that promised seed uh, to a heathen. Uh, you know, his daddy, he and his daddy were worshiping multiple gods. And he made that heathen, heathen a Hebrew. Why? Because the plan was in his mind before he framed the word. He said, I'm going to take that heathen and I'm going to save all heathen through that heathen. Made that heathen a Hebrew and said, I'm going to bless the whole world through this heathen who is now a Hebrew. I'm just trying to get us to see this morning but before I waddle down from here. When I was younger, I'd run down from here. Amen. Bro, Holly, why are you moving so slow? Well, you just keep living. Praise the Lord. I'm just glad to be here. Praise the Lord. I was headed to that long home in the grave. And I got a whole new perspective on life. I'm just glad to be anywhere. Are y'all all right in here? You see, when he chose that Hebrew and told him I'm going to bless all heathens through you. Later on, you know, you see when you're studying scripture, what these PhDs will tell you. I said what these PhDs will tell you is that when you get didactic, Instructive in the word of God you got to keep everything in context and the macro level context of the Bible the word of God is salvation and redemption and whatever it is that you are studying you've got to ask how does this fit in the plan that God had in his mind before he framed the word then you got to say how does this fit in what God revealed to his servants the prophets because Amos said what well, salvation and redemption are concerned God will do nothing I said he'll do nothing except he first reveals his secret or his hidden truth through his servants, the prophets. When you get to the new covenantal order, there's going to be something called the mystery. The mystery, mysterion. That doesn't mean you can't understand it. It just means it was hidden in the mind of God. Even when he revealed it to the prophets, he didn't make it perfectly clear like he would in the new covenantal order. You see, the mystery of God is that although we are Gentiles, and we are not Hebrews. We are not second class citizens. God had, God had us in his mind before he framed the world. Paul picked up his pen, dipped it in the invisible ink of inspiration, wrote to the Gentile, the Gentilian church at Ephesus. Now in this text, if you want to find two strong Gentile or Gentilian churches, that's where we are this morning. We got to be men who make up our mind to serve the master. And don't you dare think that we are second class citizens. We are Gentiles, but God had us in mind before he framed the word. Ephesians 1, 1 through 5. The specificity of verses 4 and 5. Paul, a Hebrew, who was the number one enemy, who is now the number one advocate. Paul writing to the Gentiles that obeyed the gospel at Ephesus. Paul says God chose us. Why did he choose us? Because before he made us, he made up his mind, amen, to be as divinity, the master for humanity. Chew on that. I mean, it sounds deep, but it's real simple. It's early on Saturday morning. So everything got to be simple this early in the morning. I said, amen, praise the Lord. Chew on that. Gentile, we are not second class citizens. Oh yes, the plan has got to come through the Hebrews. But don't you, it's, look, it's going to take 4,000 years. But a thousand years. Don't take it out of context. When it is past. See, we, we, we take that literally, but keep it in context. Old Testament, New Testament principle. A thousand years. When it's in the rearview mirror. Seems like a long time to humanity. But in the mind of divinity, a thousand years is just like a day. So even though, you see, it's not a snapshot, it's a process. Amen. 
Don't you dare feel second class to nobody. As Gentile, y'all know we ain't Hebrews. I mean, we act like Hebrews, but we're not Hebrew. But as Gentiles, we were in the mind of God before he framed the word. That Hebrew apostle, apostolic warrior said, God, Gentile church at Ephesus, chose us in him before the foundation of the word. I say, I'm closing now. Well, it don't sound like you're closing. I'm closing now. What Paul says in Romans chapter 11 is that you Gentiles are now in the kingdom, in the church, in covenant relationship with God because those Hebrews failed. Amen. But don't you start tripping because you were grafted in. And don't you mistreat those Hebrews because they failed because of unbelief. But if they turn and be faithful to God, God is able to draft them back in. So that is your conjunctive therefore. Here's why that's therefore. Now, God wants us to, you know, as Gentiles, he wants Jews and Gentiles. You see, Jews and Gentiles are not going to be, Jew, look, he, the Jews had to learn, you can't be saved just because you're a Jew. You, you can't, salvation is not in the flesh. Amen, amen. You see, the, the, the Hebrews have got to experience something called the adoption of sons. Are y'all with this? Paul picks up his pen. Uh, you know, he, he writes to the churches, plural. So we say the church at Galatia, but that ain't quite right. It's the churches, plural, in the region of Galatia. Amen. And when he gets to chapter 4, he says that Jesus was born of a woman. Jesus was born under the law. Purpose clause to redeem those that were under the law. That they might do what? receive the adoption of songs. Every Hebrew, that's what Paul was saying congruently in Romans chapter 11, you're going to be saved? Look, look, you, you, you've got to be saved by the adoption option. And then when he says to the Gentiles at Ephesus, you know, he chose us in him, that's Jude, the writer, and the Gentile Christians, the recipients, he chose us, Jew and Gentile, in him, before the foundation of the word. So I can close now. Amen. I said, I can close now. Bro, Holly, you can't close there where maybe you wouldn't if you was teaching, but I'm teaching this morning. I'm closing now. Well, you said that a minute ago. Well, this ain't no helicopter. I ain't squatting down now. Got to have a little runway. Are y'all all right? Are y'all going to help me close? Okay. God made up his mind. I hope this doesn't wound anybody's faith. Divinity made up his mind to be a master to humanity before he framed the word. Because he had foresight, because he is omniscient, he didn't foreordain or predetermine anybody to sin. He just saw before it happened that mankind would miss the mark, that mankind would be iniquitous. That mankind would commit transgression. That mankind was sin. So he made the plan before he made the man. Romans chapter 11, the Gentiles are in because the Jews fail. But don't you be high-minded. Amen. Because behold, both the goodness and the severity of God. Whole lot more meat on the bone, but time is up. And so what happens is the Gentiles were grafted in and the Jews fell out. He came into his own, his own received him not, but as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. In other words, when they get on the outs, if they be faithful, God can graft the Hebrews back in. Second point, mankind can make up his mind to be a man for the master. What better example than Paul? The number one enemy of the church. The number one persecutor of the church. The one who gave testimony that led to the death 
of those who were in covenant relationship with Christ. He had made up his mind to do everything he could to destroy the influence of this so-called prophet from Nazareth. But when God knocked him down, when he learned better, he just had two questions. Number one, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. All right, I got that. I ain't like these folk today. I don't need 40 years to turn. I want to know who you are. I'm Jesus. See, he, was, he wasn't just a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. He believed in spirits, not like the Sadducees. See, they were sad, you see. Are y'all all right in here? He was a Pharisee. And once he learned that it was the Lord who knocked him down, he just had one other question. What would you have me to do? Lord, wouldn't this world be better if folk only had two questions? Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do when you show me who you are and you reveal to me what uh, you want me to do? Is it at that point that I can make up my mind? Amen. To be a man that serves the master. Oh, yes, it's possible. It's possible for us to make up our minds. But Brother Jackson said, we need to be giving our all to God. All right. yes. What better example than Paul? Yes, sir. He was all against it. Now he's all for it. Yes. He's got all of his heart, mind, soul, and spirit in it now. Yes. On his third missionary journey, yes. when the folk wanted him to stay, he said, I must needs yeah. make this feast mm -hmm. that be at Jerusalem. And on his way to Jerusalem, the prophet took the girdle, bound him, gave the prophetic word. The man that uh, owns this girdle shall be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. He'll be delivered into the hands of that iron beast. He'll be delivered into the hands of Rome. Can't you hear David saying in the second psalm that the kings of the earth stood up with the rulers of the people? It's a prophetic word. Say this one more time. God will do nothing except he first reveals his secret or his hidden truth through his servant the prophet. You better stop telling folk we don't follow the Old Testament. Jesus said all things that are written in the law and the prophets and the psalm concerning me must be fulfilled. When you find the truth, it's going to fulfill two things. Number one, it's going to fulfill what was in the mind of God before he framed the word. And number two, it's going to fulfill what he revealed through his servants, the prophets. And so the prophet said, whoever got this girdle, he's going to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, see, if you don't put your all in all into it, you're going to turn right there and run away. But Paul says in verse 12 of chapter 21, when he heard these things, Luke writes, both we and they of that place, we begged Paul. I said we begged not to go to Jerusalem, but Paul was giving his all to God. What did Paul say when he learned that the man that uh, was bound by that girdle would be uh, uh, in serious trouble? Paul said, look, I don't know what you, just like y'all, I don't know what y'all are looking for to get this morning, but this is what you're getting. Right. Paul is saying, I don't know what you're looking for me to say, but here's my answer. What do you mean to weep and to break my heart? I'm all in. I'm not concerned about being bound. I'm ready not just to be bound only, but I'm ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound like he's all in? Doesn't, like, doesn't, doesn't that sound like he's giving his all to God? We don't need to be part-time soldiers in a full-time army. We don't need to be partially committed. No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is worthy of the kingdom. We got to put our all and all into it. Amen. We got to give our all to God. If you don't like that, uh, well, here's what Jesus said when he was asked. 
What is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all that you got. You got to put your all and all into it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. You got to put your all and all into it. This is giving our all to God. We're trying to be men, a man, who are going to serve the master. We're trying to be better men to serve the master. Because the master made up his mind as divinity to be the master for humanity. So we as humanity, show sure enough can make up our mind to be good men. To serve the master and give our all to God. To all who are gathered here today, we commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build us up in the most holy faith. Grant us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God bless my father's children. Brother Jackson. And they, go, they got some good groceries. Amen. Yes, uh, we're going to take a quick break here real quick, but let's give Brother Holly yes, a big hand. <laughs> outstanding, outstanding word. Uh, all that preaching on a Saturday morning. Yes, yes, yes. Amen, somebody. And we thank God for him and for consenting to be with us uh, on this morning. Uh, right on point with that, uh, with that subject. Giving our all. Uh, to God. And I, as he uh, phrased it, when we asked those two questions, uh, what would you have me to do? Who are you? It ought to help us to make up our mind to be men for the master. We're going to take a quick break uh, for about five or ten minutes. We'll reconvene uh, at uh, about 9.50, and then we'll introduce our workshop uh, facilitator for this morning, uh, following our break, uh, water bathrooms, uh, out in the foyer, uh, about five or 10 minutes, we'll reconvene and then we'll move further with our program. God bless you.
All right, I believe all of our brothers are back in. Aren't we having a good time up in here this morning? Amen, amen. All praises to God. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a storm. A shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes of fry, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, yes, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, it's a shelter in the time of storm. Sure enough, he is a shelter uh, in a time of storm, and I tell you, we ought to make sure uh, that uh, uh, when we go through our trials and tribulations, uh, we ought to be in Jesus. Amen, somebody. It's our great delight to introduce our workshop facilitator uh, on uh, this morning. He comes in the person of Dr. Samuel uh Thomas Jones, uh, he states that he is happily married to the former uh, Carolyn uh, Diane King, and uh, they have uh, five adult children and four grandchildren. Uh, his educational background is uh, he is a graduate of Tupelo High School, uh, received his B.S. degree in uh, biblical studies from uh, Freed Hardeman. Uh, and both the M.A. and uh, Ph.D. from Mississippi uh, State uh, University. He decided to come to God's country and get his Ph.D. Amen, somebody. I thought I was going to have somebody help me right there. Uh, amen. <laughs> uh, he says he also completed uh, postdoctorate uh, courses in marriage and family uh, therapy. He has been blessed. Uh, with the privilege of preaching the glorious gospel of Christ since 1975. Yeah. Amen, somebody. have served as uh, pulpit minister for several churches in Mississippi and Tennessee. Uh, I've spoken on several brotherhood lectureships uh, and conducted numerous gospel meetings, marriage enrichment seminars, family seminars, and youth workshops. In fact, Brother Jones was with us uh, several years ago uh, for our youth gospel meeting here uh, at Boulevard, and he is a uh, dynamic speaker. He also has uh, worked with us doing our national teachers workshop. In fact, last year, doing our national teachers workshop, outstanding facilitator. Uh, we just thank God for him. Um, he has also uh, preached the gospel in 38 states in America, uh, in several countries, such as uh, Belgium, uh, um, uh, uh, Benin, okay, France, Ghana, Guatemala, and Jamaica. Uh, he served as a faculty member at Magnolia Bible College from 1984 to 1990, and a faculty member and administrator at Fried Hardeman from 1990 to 2017. Uh, he retired as Emeritus Professor of Bible, Family Studies and Sociology from Freed Hardeman in 2017. And he is currently serving as one of the ministers for the East Jackson congregation there along with our good friend, Dr. LaVell Hayes. Uh, Dr. Sammy Jones is, is, is a good man. Uh, and he ain't just a good man, he's a good preacher. And so we thank God for him and for his consenting to come and be with us uh, on this morning, he is going to uh, share in this workshop uh, from uh, the thought, men moving from cultural compliance to a triumphant transformation. The tendency is, if we ain't careful in the church, we'll get caught up in culture. Y'all ain't hear me. But we, we got to make sure that we're going to be men for the master. Uh, we we got to get engaged in a triumphant trans transformation for the Lord. And, and, and Dr. Jones is going to help us right there 
uh, this morning. Let's loose him. Uh, we're going to get out of his way after a uh, verse of uh, selection of his choosing from Brother Ford. The next voice you will hear will be that of our dear friend and brother uh, from the East Jackson Church of Christ, Dr. Sammy Jones. Brother Ford. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need. Restore, Lord, to know that my heart is weary. Please help me, dear Lord, and I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul and revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Won't you please, Lord, stir my desire? To work in your bow and light in my heart, dear Lord, your still grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, or oh, restore my soul. It is great to be alive. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be a child of God. Brother Jackson, thank you, and to the elders, thank you all for thinking of me and inviting me to be here with you on this grand occasion. Yes. Again, it wasn't good, it wasn't expecting to see Brother Jones here, but yes. it's always good to see him, and it's good to see each one of you yes. here. A lot of you don't know me, so it's good to, that you will get acquainted today. Right. I've been knowing Brother Moore for many years when I was in Mississippi, and good to be in, in the same team with him on today. Yes. Now, I'm one of those long-winded preachers. I see the clock, but it means absolutely nothing to me. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit when come my time. Uh, I remember one congregation, I was doing a meeting, and they told me that they have a trap door. And uh, one of the elders ha held the key, I mean the remote to that trap door. And if I preached past a certain point, they just pushed the button, and I would disappear. And my wife would never see me again. My wife hollered at it at that time. She said, preach on, honey. <laughs> preach on. And, and for years, I didn't know what she meant by that. Uh, preach on. Uh, uh, preach on. Uh, but, but again, but I, I'm honored to be here with you. And again, uh, thank you for the great theme uh, that's been selected for the men that uh, planned this and organized it and implemented it. Thank you for the forethought that has gone into this. And for the topic that's been assigned to me, men moving from cultural compliance to a triumphant transformation. Yes. And so Brother Jackson called and gave me the topic, and it was just up my alley. All right. And so I said, hey, God works in mysterious ways. Yes. The providence of God, yes. uh, being that my background is sociology, we're talking about culture yes. and how culture uh, impacts us. And so hopefully today, when you leave here, uh, you'll have a better understanding of what I'm going to be talking about. So here's my goal. And again, I hope that you don't sit there, and I'm not going to read that verbatim to you. That's just for you. I've got to lay the foundation. Yes. In just a moment, we're going to get to you doing some work. Okay? So I hope you brought your pencil with you. But, uh, but my goal, and I highlighted in yellow on the yes. PowerPoint. Because those are the words that I'm going to put focus on. I want to help us to develop a, a mental picture right. that when we leave here, I have a better mental picture right. of the kind of man God wants mm -hmm. me to be. Mm -hmm. And being the kind of man God wants me to be means that there's that T word. There's a transformation. Yes. Right. We've got to be transformed. And as I look over the audience, most of us were at that age that that transformation pretty much has already occurred. Mm -hmm. But what we've got to do is help this younger generation, right. yeah. this younger generation to come on because we're not going to live forever. Right. And if the church is going to be strong, if the church is going to be what God would have it to be, we've got to help our young men yeah. to understand what a transformation means. And so that's what I want to try to help you with today. So, so that's the goal. Now, in order to achieve the goal, you got to have what? An objective. Now, I have four objectives. 
And so I'm the kind of preacher like to tell you what I'm going to do and try to carry you where I'm going to go. All right. So here's where we're trying to go today as we try to achieve that goal is to give you what a mental picture that when you leave here, understand this is the kind of man God wants me to become the kind of man God wants me to be. Now, how can we help others to get to where God wants them to be? And that's what my objective is. And so the first objective, based upon uh, Romans 12 and verse number two, that's been assigned to me. First thing I want to do, that's some words and that title that Dr. Jackson has assigned to me that I need for us to explain. And so we're going to look first at some words to be sure that we're on the same page. Is that all right? The second, I got to explain Romans 12 and verse number two. And so those are the first two things that I'm going to do is to try to explain the word, then explain the meaning, and then we get to your word. And the first word is this. There's a mindset. Why is the mindset important? Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man what? In his heart. You, you got to have the mindset right. and the right behavior. You see, when you talk about culture compliance, what are we talking about? The world. Right. Yeah. The world wants you to have a mindset. Right. Yeah. The world wants you to have a mindset because that mindset is going to determine your what? Your behavior. Yeah. Your, uh, you are a product of what you think. And your thinking is a product of the groups and organizations that you are associated with. All right? And we all come out of the world. Mm -hmm. Come on, we weren't born in the church. Brother Jackson's already talking about 50 years ago when they were out. Well, we won't go back to that. (laughs) Okay? All of y'all weren't born in the church. Some of you have been out there in the world. We we say back in East Jackson, your Gentile days, your Gentile days shape you. But now that you're in Christ, you got to let go of what? The culture. you got to change your mind. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. And I want to just mention some concepts. And I want you to tell me, here's what the world mindset. Here's the world mindset of this behavior of this particular concept. And then the third, that ultimate, that triumphant transformation. That's what we're going to talk about, that spiritual. This is what God wants us to be. This is the kind of mindset God wants us to have and the type of behavior. Am I making sense of where we're going? All right. Are you sure you're with me? Are you ready? Now, brother, you got to put your seatbelts on. There may be a little turbulence as we go along the way because we're living in time. And I know I'm talking to the cream of the crop here. But we're living in some deadly times yes, because anything and everything is going on in the world. And it's just a matter of time. It creeps into the church. Yes, yes. And we already have seen it with the, Mes- the, Methodist, the Methodist and the Presbyterian that they say you can be gay and be a preacher mm-hmm. in the Methodist church mm-hmm. and the Presbyterian church. Right. It's just a matter of time yes. before we start saying that that's going to be. Okay, in the Lord's church. And we laugh at it now. But we're just a few years away from that creeping into the Lord's church. And so those are my objectives. So let's go to the first objective. And that is some key words. All right, there are six words. And again, I'm not going to read that to you. You've got that. But I'm just going to go over it. The first, it was talking about cultural. Now, in that form, it's an adjective. But the word we're looking at is culture. And from a cultural perspective, culture means three words I want you to remember. Norms, values, and beliefs. We are a product, when you talk about culture, you're talking about your norms. Norms are expected patterns of behavior. The way you behave based upon your family, your peers. You know, why is it that if you go up to New York, they don't eat grits? But down south, man... Yeah. Breakfast without grits is not breakfast. You ask a New Yorker, you want some grits? They say, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. But now they say, just give me one. You know, you know again, unless you're from south and you're going up to New York. Right. Because they don't understand it. Because down south, we put what in our tea? We put sugar. Mm-hmm. But if you go up north, 
They don't put sugar in their tea. You know why? Norm. Their expected behavior pattern. Value. What's dear to you? What's dear to you? What's really? You see, your values you're determine your behaviors yes, and beliefs. Beliefs are what you believe to be true and factual. Yes, and so when you're talking about culture, you're talking about your norms, yes, your values, and your beliefs, right. your shared attitudes. And so when we're talking about we all come out of the world, and the world culture is different from God's culture. Yes, are you still with me? Yes, and so when we're talking about cultural, Transition. We're talking about when God, when we come out of the world and into the church, God expects us to leave the culture outside the church. The culture doesn't tell me how to worship God. God's word tells me how to worship God. Now I'm supposed to be doing a lecture. And I can't preach now. Y'all, y'all tell me to calm down. Now compliance. Compliance means that you are doing the wishes and commands of others. And so culture expects you to comply. Yes, and our young people understand if they want to fit in a game, uh-huh. they got to act like the rest of the game. Yes, and they're forced to do that because they want acceptance. Yes. Okay? Yes. They want to feel that, uh, they don't say they want to feel that sense of belonging. Yes. But we've got to help them understand when you become a Christian. Yes. Yes. Culture compliance is not that you do what culture tells you to do anymore. But you got to be able to make that distinction. And so culture, norms, values, and what? Beliefs. Compliance means doing what that culture expects you to do. And so when you put the two words together, culture compliance is doing what others particularly want you to do so you what? You fit in. Yes. So you can feel accepted. Why is it in the inner city? Why are gangs so important? Because they fit in. Yeah. And if you're outside the gang, you're like a shoe. On a, a right shoe on a left foot, you stick out. And so that's what we're talking about. Culture compliance is in the world. They expect you to believe a certain way. They expect you to behave a certain way. And they expect you to value things a certain way. But then we go to that triumphant. A transformation. Triumphant is an adjective. Yes. And triumphant in this sense is talking about you have achieved something. Yes, sir. And when you achieve something, what do you want to do? You just want to tell somebody. Yes. You just want to jump up and down. You're happy. And that's what we got to get our young men and the Lord of church is to be happy. Yes. To be excited like we were 30, 40 years ago. Yes. When we became a Christian, we were on fire for the Lord. Our young generations, they're not on fire for about being men for the Lord. And we've got to come up with some avenue. What can we do to help them like we used to be? We just couldn't wait to get the church to serve. Now they want to come and sit in the back if they come. What we've got to do, what can we do? And that means we've got to do some creative thinking. Brother and sister, if we, men, can I be frank with you? If we don't get busy and talking to our young men, and getting them excited, what is the church going to be like in 20 years from now? Well, we've got to do something. That's right. And so that's what we're talking about. We've got to get to this cultural compliance, okay? All right, there we go. Yeah. Now, the second word is what? Transformation. Yeah. Transformation simply refers to what? A change. But not a 50% change. It's a complete change. Right. And, and the key word, complete. And that is we can't they got to put in their mind the mentality. It can't be where you can be 50% a Christian and 50% in the world. Yeah. This triumphant trans- transformation is a complete alteration. Right. It's a complete change in the way you think because the way you think influences what? Your actions. Right. And then you put the two words together. Triumphant transformation <laughs> represents a departure. Yeah. A departure from being Control from the dictates of the world to an inexpressible. I like that because that's a biblical term. When you become a Christian, you ought to have joy that's inescapable. King James used the word indescribable. You ought to have a joy that's just so excited. And we've got to come up with a way to make young men 
excited about being a Christian. And so you put all that together. And that is, they come out of the world. And a man in the Lord's church ought to be excited. They ought to be in an indescribable joy of being a child of God because they're standing up for something. They're not standing for what's in the world. They're standing up for what God wants. Are you ready for number two? Let's go to the meeting. Romans 12 and verse number two. Paul says, not to be what? Conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by what? Renewing of the mind that you may what? Prove. Now, the word prove here, we'll talk about it in just a moment. We got to show it. That means it prove means to demonstrate. Prove in this text means that we got to display to the world the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the only way that's going to occur, a process. And that is the renewing of the mind. The process of letting go the culture. But if you don't put something in here, it's not going to come out here. Oh, y'all didn't get that. If you don't put something in here, it's not going to come out here. And so when it comes to being a husband, Oh, there we go. If you don't teach, let's go back to the fundamentals. If you don't teach a little boy at age six what it means to be a little boy, when he reaches 15, he's going to be as Fred. Now, some of you watch Fred Sanford. You remember Fred Sanford would always say, well, let me tell you this. Nobody is born gay. Nobody is born homosexual. You are a product of what you think. And, and notice, you say, let me just show you this. Any one of you could become homosexual. You know why? It's because it's a choice. Mm-hmm. It, it's a choice. You don't think, think I'm lying? Right. Get locked up for life in a prison. Oh, come on. Come on. After about 20 years, a man started looking good. Yeah. All right? Now, know you say, oh, you were just as straight as an arrow when you went in there. But either you, either they start looking good or you pick up a bar of soap. Oh, come on, y'all, come on. You reach out and your whole life has changed. And if, it's a, if, you, if, you, if you were born that way, you can't change. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, some of you used to be, but you have made a change. Why do you make a change right here? And now, let's get to what Paul is saying here. Paul gives four exhortations. Four exhortations. Here's the first. Do not be what? Don't be controlled. Conform. Don't be controlled. Don't be under the dictates of the world. What's the world? Your culture. Don't let your culture tell you what it means to be a young man. What it means to be a man. Let the word of God tell you. And our culture changes. The word of God stays the same. That's why we're the same. In 50 years now, we ought to still be the same kind of men. Even though culture has changed. Stay with me. Be what? Transformed. Be completely changed. Don't be 50% changed. You see, some men want to be 50%, 25%. God said, as the first lesson for the holly, you got to be all. And then he says the third how do you do it? Here's the process. Renewing the mind. You got to change the mind. If you don't change the way you think, then you're going to be like the culture and the church. And guess what? You'll never be the full potential God wants you to be. So how do you become what God wants you to be? Change the mind. And then number four, that'll help you to what? Prove it. That'll help you to show. That'll help you to display. You don't have to tell anybody you're a Christian man. They'll be able to see by the life you live, by what you say. Now, let's get at what Paul's intent and these exhortations. Let's get to, do not be conformed to this world. And that is, he says, those in the Lord's church, you don't pattern. Notice, if you're in the Lord's church, you're not shaped. You're not molded by your culture anymore. That means those buddies out in the world, they don't tell you what to do on Saturday night. They don't tell you where to go on Sunday morning. You see, you got to start teaching that. Because if we don't teach it to them, and we're not talking about, you got to sit down and talk to them like this. 
You got to sit down and say, do you understand what it means to be a, a wife, a husband, rather? You see, you got to talk. You see, we don't do that anymore. And because we don't have that relationship, there, that, the absence in the church is commitment. Absence is commitment. Paul says, don't be conformed. Notice, you're in the world, but you're not what? Of the world. John D. Berry, 25 years ago, I heard him say something about water in the boat. He stayed with me. There's nothing wrong with a boat being in water. But there's something wrong when water gets into the boat. Oh, you, did you hear what I just said? There's nothing wrong with a boat being in water. But there's something wrong when water gets in the boat. There's nothing wrong with a Christian being in the world. But there's something wrong when the world gets into the Christian. And when the world gets into us, and we start acting like the world, we're no longer what God wants us to be. Christian men, they don't talk. They don't behave because they don't think like the world. We're different. And notice what the Bible says. Christian men don't give in to the what? Tremendous peer pressure. And Peter said they think it's strange. They think it's strange that you don't run. That's okay. Call me names. You see, when I was in high school, in Tupelo High School, you know what the word was out there about Sam Jones? Sam Jones was gay. You know why? Because Sam Jones didn't go to the parties. Sam Jones didn't do a lot of other things that my peers were doing. You know why? Because I was an obedient Christian. And I'm glad I had a grandmother. I'm glad I had a grandmother. I came out of a culture where grandmother meant something to you. Now I didn't want to disappoint grandmother. Before I knew the Lord and had a relationship, I had a grandmother that taught me to love her and to love God. And there are things I wouldn't do because I didn't want to disappoint grandmother. But then eventually it was, I don't want to disappoint God. But when you're 15, you know of God, but you don't know God. But I knew somebody that knew God. And that was Naomi. And Naomi taught me to love God. And so I didn't want to do anything that was culture. And that's what our children are missing. That's what we're missing. And that's why the black culture, we're lagging behind. Because we have a left what culture gave us. And now we don't pass on anything to our children. Look at the Hispanic culture, the yeah. Japanese culture. These are two cultures that have moved into America, and they're taking America by storm. You know why? Look at the culture. Oh, man, let me move on. But we have gotten away from that. And we need a culture in the black church, and that is God's word supersedes everything. Oh, let me keep on. Transform. Transform means that there is a... And the Greek word, that's where they get this word metamorphosis. Yes. But metamorphosis is that that's a change. Yes. And we're changed from being what? A caterpillar uh -huh. to a butterfly. Oh, yeah. oh you, didn't, you didn't get that, but just stick yeah. with me. Listen to this. Uh -huh. You see, a caterpillar in one thing uh -huh. for a little time. Uh -huh. But then he has a complete, do you get the word? Complete different thing. Yes. Come on, it's a worm that's what? Crawling. That's in the old, that's the world. When we were in the world, we were crawling. But then we met Jesus. We met Jesus and he got into our lives and we stopped crawling and now we're what? We're flying. You see, that's what they need to understand. That we're different. I don't crawl anymore. You know why? Because I met Jesus. And Jesus has changed me. Changed my outlook in life. And because he have changed me, I treat my wife different. I treat my children different. I treat the people that I know in the community. I treat people different because I'm not the crawling man anymore. I'm a flying man. I'm a flying. You see, that's in the mind. In the mindset. Christians are to undergo a complete change. They are changed from being what? And conforming. Caterpillar means you, you're conforming. Yes. You're just doing what everybody else is doing yes. in the world. But you're changed. And that's what we got to get them to understand. There's been a change in you. Yes. And now I become a butterfly. Yes. And now as a butterfly, I'm doing not what culture wants me to do. 
I, I, you know what? Culture says it's all right to beat your wife. Right. Culture says it's all right to neglect your children. Yeah. Matter of fact, you don't even have to take care of them. Yeah. The, the state will take care of them. But a butterfly says, hey, they're mine. Yeah. I'm going to take care of them. Yeah. Butterfly says, I'm gonna have, if I have to work three jobs, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Because that's what a man will do. You see, the culture transformation and that is that we're no longer letting the culture, but now we're letting God's word tell us how to think because the way we think will determine the way we behave. Now, the third uh, uh, exhortation is the process. The process, how do you become a new man? How do you become a new man? Christian men must change the way they think. If they're going to change. And I've already talked about this. But in Matthew chapter 15, verse 17, Jesus talked about it. It's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man. You can eat every day with unwashed hands. Some of us. Some of you are like you my age. Do you remember that time when you used to go to the hill and get some red dirt? And eat dirt? I'm talking about you eat dirt. Yeah. No, come on. When you grew up in the projects like I did. In the housing project, we had a red hill behind us. And when it would rain, where would you go? Grandma wants some dirt. And when, if it's good enough for grandmama, guess what? It must be good. So here I am. Why did I eat dirt? Because grandmama was eating it. Okay, come on. Jesus said, if that which goes into the mouth, it doesn't defile the man. But that which goes into what? The heart. And that's what he was telling them. Cut culture loose. Yeah. Because if you don't cut culture loose, you can't be my disciple. Yeah. And that's why culture must be deleted. Yeah. We understand that terminology nowadays. Yeah. And it has to be replaced. Yeah. That's why he says in Ephesians 4, you got to put off. That's delete. Then you got to put on. That's replacing. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. And how do you do that? With the word of God. Yeah. You're led by what? The spirit. Yeah. You led through the spirit, through the word. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, when you obey the gospel, yeah. he gives you the spirit. Yeah. But that spirit has to be fed. And we in Ephesians 5, verse 18, we got to be filled with the spirit. Yeah. Now, think about this. If you see a man who's filled with wine or alcohol, you can tell it. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Again, going back to Stanford and Son. Yes, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. They had a man on there that used to drink all the time. Yeah. Now, what was his name? Woody. Oh, okay. I knew y'all. Hey, I knew y'all get you. Y'all knew Woody. Yeah. Hey, 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 oh, Woody. Yeah. Hey, was married to, hey, what, what, what was his wife's name? Yeah. Yeah. Esther said, if you don't put that baller down, I'm going to twitch your neck off. You know? But again, how can you tell someone under the influence of alcohol? The way they walk and the way they talk. He said, somebody ought to be able to tell when you're under the influence of the spirit. Yeah. When you're on the job, why is that man such a hard worker? He doesn't stay in the restroom. Yeah. He's on time. Yeah. And you're always saying, do you need somebody to work overtime? Yeah. He's under the influence. Yeah. He's under the influence. Here's a man who say, honey, I love you so much. Yeah. He's under the influence. But a man who's not under the influence yeah. is a total different man. Yeah. Okay, we're about to get down to your part. And that is now we got to, how, why do we do all this? Yeah. That we can prove that's yeah. power in God's word. Yeah. God's word can change you. Right. I haven't always been what I am today. Yeah. But I am what I am today because of the good yeah. and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yeah. And so that's power in God's word. Now, yeah. let's get to with the little time that we have left. Let's get to section three. And that is the mindset of some concept of culture compliance. And, and so what I want you to do, yeah. I want you to either write it down or put it in your mind. Let's go to the first one, under culture. When the world, when it comes to love, what does, it, what does love mean to a man in the world? What does love mean to a man in the world? Okay, so, so again, write down. Your definition, what does it mean, love, for a man in the world? Here's what I got. Love self more than anything. That's what culture says. Hey, uno. Who's uno? Me. 
I love God. I love myself more than I love God. I love myself more than I love my wife, children, and anything else. You see, that's the culture. Now, if you ain't coming to church like that, guess how much you're going to give on come on Sunday? Guess how you're going to take care of your children? Guess how you're going to take care of your family? You know why? Culture says you make sure the self is taken care of. But see, if that's all our men know, then that's why the church is in a problem today. Woman. Or women, rather. Oh, uh, they had to be used and abused. You see, that's the culture. And if you're a young man, 15, 16, 17, 18, and that's all you've been taught, and now you've been baptized, and that culture is still influencing you, and you're wondering why he hadn't cut the world loose, because he hadn't took, cut what? Culture loose. See, we got to get them to understand. That's a triumphant, what? Transformation. Yes. Okay, what's the next one? God. God. Oh, boy. Before they become a Christian, what? Hey, somebody tell me. What's the, what's the world concept of God? Speak about it. What's God? God's not a priority. Someone else. He doesn't exist. What? Anyone else? What's the world definition of God? Here's what I see. Doesn't exist. And he's made up by whom? Man. There's no God. I'm God. You see, and if you go around thinking you're God, God tells you, you got to put your faith. You remember the rich young ruler? Yeah. Huh. They're going to be a lot of people running. That's why our young men, they see themselves as a God. And it's difficult for them to come to God because they see themselves as a God. Yeah. I'm not going to let no book written by a white man tell me what to do. Y'all ever heard that one? Oh, that, that's a book written by a white man. I'm not going to let no white man tell me what to do. God is a white man. Married in any other group. Guess what black women are doing? They have become lesbians. And because they are lesbians, they don't respect men. They love themselves. And, oh, I don't have time to deal with all this. They're seeing these tendencies in their children, but they won't say anything because they want their children to be happy. And so that's why we're seeing. I don't know how it is. I know in Jackson, we have a problem in our junior high school. I don't know what about in Memphis, but I got the tendency to believe same thing's going on here. Let's look at father. What it means to be a father? He's just a sperm provider. Absentee. That's the world. Just provide sperm. You don't have to be there for him. What's a friend? Friend's a dog. Friend's a dog. That's, that's my dog. That's what it said. That's my dog. That's someone to get in trouble with. That's that definition of a friend. A son is someone to give the parents and grandchildren to raise. Oh, you didn't hear that. Let me say that one again. You know what a son means? A son is just someone to give parents. There we go. Thank you all. It's just someone to the, hey, I'm, my job is just to provide my parents with some grandchildren so they can raise. And can't you see this is a culture? Yes, sir. And we can go on and on, but I got to go on to, to my next. A job. That's just, why am I going to work? A job just controlling. That's why they don't want to work. Because they see a job as a controlling. It doesn't allow you to be yourself. And I don't want anybody telling me what to be. I want to be my own man. Do you understand culture? Now let's go to our last one. Yes. Now that you've been transformed, let's look at how the Christians see these things. Yes. First, Love. You love God, and then you love whom? Yeah. Others yeah. more than yourself. Right. That means you love your wife more than you love yourself. Yeah. That means you love your children more than you love yeah. yourself. Now contrast that with, again, the culture. Can you understand? See, that's what we're talking about. This is what God wants, is for there to be a culture trend. But that takes some teaching. You got to sit down and talk to your sons and to your grandsons. Yeah. And explain to them what it means to be a man, a Christian man. Yes, not a worldly man. I'm not controlled by the culture. God blessed me with three boys. And I'm proud of them. I hope you, I know you're proud of your children. But those years going, letting them grow up in a little town of Henderson, Tennessee, with 
would able, enable me to teach them three things, norms, values, and beliefs. Yeah. And those three men, they understand. They're all married. Yes, I've taught them. My, my oldest one, Eric, when he was four years old in Starkville, Mississippi, came home one day and he said, Daddy, Daddy, I want to marry my friend. And then he said, I want to marry Stevie. Oh, boy. Rhonda, get in here. That was a teaching moment. He loved his best friend, Stevie. And that's why Dad had said, and you're going to marry Stevie. The day's going to come, and I hope you understand, you love girls. You see, you got to teach them you love girls. And if you don't teach them that, that tendency can stay there. And then when they turn 14, 50, they experiment. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, they experiment. Mom and Dad, not that. They experiment. And if it becomes a good experience, they adopt that as their action. That's why you got to talk to them. But now little boys are having those and little girls are having and nobody's around to tell them anything different. Women, respect them. Thank God for them. That's the Christian. God, surrender to him. And, and do you get the point? And go on with the others. And I want you to think about these. Alcohol. Drugs is to be avoided. Yes. It's not to be tampered with. Well, yes, the Bible doesn't say this is a sin. But the Bible tells me in Proverbs 23, avoid it when it's what? When it's red. Yeah. Avoid it. I tell you what, I tell people, and I should tell my boys this growing up, yeah. your mom and I, we have a good marriage. Eric, don't get out there and let your buddy talk you into drinking. And you kill yourself in a car accident. You know what? Your mom and dad, we're gonna, one of us is going to blame the other. And you know what? It, it destroys a good marriage, a good family. Yeah. You got to do something to make a connection with the yeah. children, why they need to avoid things. Yeah. And I'm glad I never had a problem of drinking mm -hmm. with my boys. Because I taught them to love their parents more than they love themselves. That's why you avoid alcohol. Why do your little brother got to come to your funeral? Because you decided to get out there and drink and drive with your buddies and kill yourself. You see, you got to change their values. Because their values shape their behavior. In closing, let me go through the rest of it. Now, I want to close with this. I want you to do this, and that's it. We've gone through each one of these already. The other side. But I want to get to the last point. Yeah. I want you to write down one lesson. Yeah. I want you to do three, but I want you to write down one because I want, I'm going to call on some of you that I want you to share. What's one lesson that you take from the days? What is something you take home with you today? Because it's good to come and do this. But if you don't crystallize something in your mind that you take with you, that you leave it on your way back home and say, you know, I can use this. I, with my grandchildren, my young people back at church, I can use this. The young men back there, I can use this. What, can, what is one thing you can take back with you and help them understand the cultural compliance moving from it to a triumphant transformation? Yeah. What's one thing you can carry with you? And I got three minutes. Okay? Now, Yes. Thank you. Be a, leader and lead by example. Be a leader and lead by example. Why? Why is that so important? Because what you're doing might be your life. That's it. They may be two years old, but they're watching you. They may, if they see you doing, and you up there talking about, you ought to do this, and then, you know, then you're at home, act another way, you're in the community. You got to remember 24-7. You got to be an example. Because if when young people see hypocrisy, they lose all respect. You can't tell them anything. But when they see you are consistent, they're, they're gravitated to you. And that's why it's so important that if we're going to talk about a cultural transition, we got to be sure that we are there. Because if we're not there, they're going to say, that's a hypocrite. And you can't tell me nothing. Someone else. Come on, I, I, I'm a teacher. I can, I can point. I don't know a lot of names, but I can point it. Yes. 
be aware and take advantage of teachable moments. Great. Teach, I mean, we've gotten two good thoughts thus far. Teachable moments. Because you never know. You may not get it again. When they inquire, I don't care what you're doing, stop and teach. Stop and follow up. Follow up. Teachable moments. Be an example. Yes, over here. Yes. Because it's not just overdue, and that's a problem in the house church. It really, I, I'm truly passionate about the church world because uh, the, the movement right now is unspoken out. Yes. And I think as Christian people, we've got to be very careful in our boldness to live like that for real. Yep. I mean, come on. we, we got to teach values, norms. they got to be consistent, and they're, they're not, they don't see people by race. We see people by standards. We see people by standards. And if we don't stand up for what's right, you know, then who will? Okay? We've got to stand up for what's right, and they got to see that in us. Yes. 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 Yeah, it got to be. Okay, one more. My time is up. Back here. And we got to teach them to value the Lord. And when yeah. you value something, right. it'll go with lesson number one, Brother Hoss. It becomes first in your life. Yes. My time is up. I hope I've said something. I hope I've given you something that, yes. that when you leave here, yes. it can help you to help our men yes. to be men. Yes. May God bless you. My goodness, I ain't smart enough to pull all this stuff out of that one verse, but I sure know who to get to do it. Yes, sir. Amen. Wasn't that outstanding? Let's yes, give this brother another hand. Outstanding. You did exactly what we need you to do with that subject, and I knew. He was going to do that. That's why That's why you got the call. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I, I'm, I'm already seeing, uh, because with, with everything that has transpired so far this morning, I'm, I'm already seeing that uh, we probably need to do a part two uh, of, of this Men's Day, Lord's Willing, in 2025. Because, see, this ain't, an, and, and, you know, maybe we might have to do some kind of question and answer for them. Because, see, this, I, this wasn't enough time to get everything out of that particular subject. And, and Holly already got us off to a good start. And, and you, ju you built on that. Uh, and uh, we, just had a, we just having a good time this morning. So I'm already seeing that we might just have to do a part two. Amen. Amen. Lord's willing in 2025 uh, from, from these very uh, subjects. Brother Jones, God bless you. Thank you again for an outstanding job. We're going to take another quick break, uh, about five minutes, and then we'll come back uh, and have our keynote address uh, for this Men's Day, this 2024 Men's Day, and uh, you in for a treat. Uh, amen. Let's, let's take about five minutes, and we'll be back. Uh, at about uh, 10, 1045, 1046. All right. God bless you.
I believe everybody is back, and we're going to uh, reconvene and, and get into our final uh, session for uh, today. Boy, I tell you, uh, I don't I don't know a better place to be on a Saturday and 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 have this good a time, man. I tell you, uh, I just can't can't stop talking about the good brother Jones. Very detailed. Amen, and, and I stand in job with Brother Holly, and now we we getting ready to uh, have the icing on the cake. Amen. We're gonna have a, a selection of song by a song leader, and then we'll come uh, with the introduction of our uh, keynote speaker for for this morning, Brother. Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwell in me. Touch my eyes that I might see all your goodness, grace, and power. Stay beside me every hour. A be my drink, be my living bread. Uh, give me shelter, keep me fed, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, dwell in me, and Holy Spirit, comfort me, uh, let my heart be one with thee. Oh, when I'm worried, soothe my mind. Let me sweet contentment find. May I run this wicked race, filled by your amazing grace. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, comfort me. Once again, we're just grateful to the God of heaven for his goodness toward us and how he is truly blessing us uh, on this morning. And we're so grateful to all of you for taking the time out of your Saturday morning uh, to be here with us in this annual uh, Men's Day. Uh, it is our great joy and delight to introduce uh, to some and present probably to most uh, our keynote speaker for uh, for today, certainly no stranger uh, to our brotherhood. He comes in the person of Dr. Uh, Billy Carl Moore, uh, who is a native of Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, he is the son of the late uh, Eva uh, Hallinan, uh, Halliman and the late uh, James uh, Halliman. He is a graduate of East Side High School, uh, Delta State University, and he received his doctorate from the University of Mississippi. Dr. Moore obeyed the gospel under the leadership of his father and the gospel brother, James A. Hadley Sr., at the age of seven. Amen. Dr. Moore has served as a minister of the Church of Christ uh, in Ruleville, Mississippi, since 1980. Under his leadership, the church in Ruval has grown spiritually and numerically. And in addition, he, or rather the congregation, uh, has administered summer enrichment programs, uh, uh, breast education programs, uh, soup kitchens, uh, and clothes giveaways for the needy, scholarship programs, a blood pressure education program, and a mentoring program. Also under his leadership, uh, share groups were organized at the local congregation uh, to carry out the ministries of the church. Dr. Moore has preached uh, on men's day lectureships, state and national lectureships, uh, and have traveled throughout the nation, or the nation rather, preaching the gospel. Uh, he retired after 37 and a half years from Delta State University uh, in June of 23 where he served in many roles, including chair of the Division of Economic and Finance 
uh, director of the Center for the Community and Economic uh, Development. Brother Heavy. Amen, somebody. During his tenure at DSU, uh, he has also served as the first African American dean. Amen, somebody. Amen. He retired from uh, this post after 20 years of service uh, as dean. He is married to the former Deborah Green, and they are the proud parents of two daughters, uh, Andrea and Alicia. Uh, and they have been married for 46 years. Amen, amen. Got to know Brother Moore over the last several years. Uh, been knowing him uh, for years, but got to know him on a, on a personal level uh, over the last couple of years. Brother Moore is just a good man. And in addition to being being a being a good man, he he's he's a great husband, great father. I found out he's an avid football fan. Amen. We uh we were down with them last year and um Friday night he he uh took me to a football game and I, I felt underdressed because when he when he came to pick me up, he had on his full hat uh, uh representing uh, I believe it was Cleveland Central High School. He had on his hat, t shirt, school colors. I mean he was ready. And I was like, okay, do I need to go find me an outfit somewhere? I felt underdressed, but he is an avid football fan, and uh, but not only is he a good man, good husband, good wife, avid football fan, this brother is some kind of preacher. He is a walking Bible, uh, and, and, and you know, most preachers have a calling card, and, and uh, Billy Moore's calling card, when, when the preaching started to get good, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Come here, Paul. <laughs> yeah, he started having himself a good time uh, in the Lord. I, I, we love him dearly, uh, just, just, just a great man of God, and we thank God for him, for how he has uh, blessed the brotherhood for many years, and we are grateful that he uh, has consented to come and be with us on today. Uh, and he's going to close us out. As he speaks to our theme, uh, a made-up man to be men for the master. We're going to loose him and let him go. Uh, after the uh, next verse of a song, from our song leader, the next voice you will hear will be that of our dear friend uh, and brother, uh, minister to the Del Mar Avenue Church of Christ in Ruville, Mississippi, Dr. Billy Moore. Come on, song leader. Let's bring this preacher. Watch ye therefore, you know not the day when the Lord shall call your soul away. And if you labor striving for the right, then you shall wear a golden crown. You know that you shall wear a, shall wear a crown. Oh, when the trumpet sound, when the trumpet sound, you shall, shall wear a crown. Oh, you shall wear a golden crown. If you fight the good old fight of faith and with patience run the Christian race when you lay your gospel armor down, then you shall wear a golden crown. You know that you shall shall wear a crown oh when the trumpet sounds when the trumpet sounds you shall shall wear a crown and no you shall wear a gold
you bow with me, please, in a moment of prayer? Father God in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together in your house. Thank you so much for the talents, the abilities that you have given to your servants. Thank you so much for the wonderful lessons that, that we have heard from Brother Harley and from Brother Jones. And now, Father, as we study a portion of your word together, we pray for wisdom, we pray for knowledge. We pray that everything that we do and say will be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's the name of your son, Jesus, we humbly pray. Let us all together say, amen. amen. I do want Brother Jackson, the elders, and all the brothers and this congregation to know how grateful I am uh, to be here this morning. I have been blessed tremendously with uh, Brother Holly, Brother uh, Jones, and, and, and you all look, it's just good to see everybody. It's good to see uh, members from there, my brother Williams, brother brother Calhoun. Good to see all the preachers now, brother Jones, brother William. Look, everybody, everybody. It is it is just good uh, to be here. Uh, I do know that I'm standing between us and lunch, so I am going to go ahead and get started. Let me call your attention this morning to Romans chapter number 12 again for emphasis. I want to read verses 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to speak for the next few moments from the assigned topic a made-up mind to be mean for the master. A made-up mind to be mean for the master. As has been stated, the Apostle Paul says that we are not to conform to the world. We are not to allow the world to mold our thinking, our mindset, and our mentality. We are not to allow the world to, to define for us what a man should be and how a man should behave. Well, but we must all remember now that uh, when it comes to conforming and when it comes to transformation, that there was a time when we were out there in the world. I can't look down my nose at other people because at one time I was out there with them. Oh, how do you know it, preacher? Listen to the book in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Paul says, and you had he quippered who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. I can't look down on you because we were in the same boat. 
but we don't need to walk like that anymore. Listen to the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 14. Paul said, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. In other words, when we were out there, we were walking in ignorance. When we were out there, we had a messed up mind. But I got a question, church. How do you go from a messed up mind to a made up mind? Listen to, listen, listen, listen to the book in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 22. The Bible says that ye put all concerning the former conversation, concerning the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful love and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and now wait a minute that you put on the new man wait a minute wait a minute what do we have have to do we have to put on the new man well how do i put on the new man i got to have knowledge in order to put on the new man. What knowledge do I need to have? Listen to the book in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9. Listen to what the Bible says. For this cause, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye be filled Wait a minute, watch, watch this now. You be filled with the knowledge of God, with the knowledge of his will. Wait a minute, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What does it take to have a new mind? Listen to the book in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible said, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In order to put on the new man, I got to have some knowledge. Now, wait a minute. Watch this now. I got to have some knowledge of God's will. Whoa, but it's not enough to just have some knowledge. I got to have a made up mind that I'm going to do something with the knowledge. Oh, wait a minute. Watch this now. Because we don't need just emotionalism. See, you can hear something and it can make you feel good. And you will go on for a little while. Oh, but when it gets tough, emotionalism will not work. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, watch this now. You uh, remember in Ruth chapter number one and verse number 14, you remember when, when Naomi left Moab to go back to Bethlehem. When she went to Moab, she had a husband, had two sons. Going back to Bethlehem is just her and her daughter-in-law. Well, she said to them, I, I can't have any more, any more son. And if I could have them, you couldn't wait long enough for them to grow up. Go on back home to your people and your God. Oh, look now. Both Ruth and Orpah lifted up their voice and wept. Oh, but watch what Orpah did. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went back. Ruth, on the other hand, claimed to, embraced her. She wrapped her arms around her. I'm not going back. Wait a minute, as men, we got to make up our mind. I'm not going back to where I used to be. Oh, but notice what what Naomi said to her. She said, now, you see your sister-in-law, she went back 
you go on back after your sister-in-law. She said, wait a minute now, entreat me. Don't ask me. Don't ask me to leave you because where you go, I am going to go. Where you lodge, I am going to lodge. Your people shall be my people. Say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, watch this now. Where your, your God will be my God. Where you die, that's where I am going to die. And I'm going to be buried. May the Lord do unto me. And more and more so, if aught but death separate you and me. And the Bible said when she saw that she was steadfastly minded, she left out speaking to her. Oh, if I had time, people ought to be able to see when you have a made up mind. Wait a minute, watch this now. And when you make your mind up, if you are a family man, oh, you ought to make, make up the mind. Make up your mind. I'm going to do right. And those in my household, they are going to follow my lead. Oh, how do you know it, preacher? Come here, Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verse number 14. Joshua said, fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and truth. Uh, Joshua said, put away, put away those false gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in the land of Egypt. He said, now wait a minute, and serve you the Lord. He said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Wait a minute, he said, choose you this day whom you are going to serve, whether the gods that your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorite in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, wait a minute, you can do what you want to do. But as for me and my house, whether you come or go or not, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Wait a minute, wait a minute, watch this now. Because it's easy to talk about a made-up mind. Oh, but when it comes to living one, uh, it is a little more difficult. And I am what you call a simple-minded man. I like to see an example. Well, wait a minute, watch this now. Because sometimes, men, we look at ourselves. And we say, well, I'm not the preacher. Uh, I'm just a nobody. Well, I want to show you this morning how nobodies from nowhere can become somebody when they make up their mind that they are going to follow God Almighty. Wait a minute. I want to look at some men that we don't hear too much about. I want to look at some men. Now bear in mind, Romans 15, verse number 4. The Bible says, now whatsoever thing were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. I want to look at some men. You all remember David, the one that God called the sweet psalmist of Israel. You all remember David, the one who honored God and said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You remember David, the one who said, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Oh, you all remember David. Well, not David wasn't always in the palace. David was out in a cave, but David had, according to 2 Samuel 23, about 37 men. That was narrowed down to about 30 men. That was narrowed down to about 3 men. 
And these men, uh, some of them, they were known as the mighty men of David. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, watch this now. They were mighty men of David. Who was David? David was their king. They were mighty men of their king. Well, if I can look at them and see what made them mighty men of their king, then I can look at me and see what I need to do in order to be a mighty man of my king, God Almighty. Oh, wait a minute. Watch this now. Come here. First Chronicles chapter number 11 and verse number 10. The Bible says these mighty men of David, they strengthened themselves in him, in his kingdom. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did they do? They strengthened themselves in him, in his kingdom. Oh, it's for the master. And I'm staying at home. When it is church time. Oh, well, and do you not know? One study said that a 70 80% of men don't go to service 